Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this fifth webinar in the series demonstrating how skills acquired in the oil, in this oil and gas industries can be applied to the new technologies that are leading us towards net zero. I'm joined by four presenters, each an expert in their field, uh, covering carbon capture and storage, hydrogen, geothermal, and wind. In the previous seminars, we thought that the oil and gas industry might be expected to be in steady decline, and we delivered the webinars, that, as, as I've indicated, on the subjects and the technologies that might replace it. We explained the various processes. We showed that the skills that were involved in those processes were relevant and could be acquired from the oil and gas industry, and we answered as many questions as possible. We are welcoming questions here today. So the sooner you put them in, the more likely they are to be answered, because we expect that there'll be quite a few questions coming from the audience. Where we are now is not quite where we might have expected to be when we started these seminars last November. COVID is gratefully just about ended, at least the restrictions have, the complaint has not, the disease has not. And of course, the big event of Russia invading Ukraine has caused a major spike in energy prices, which has changed the economics of many parts of our activity. And the UK government issued, for better or worse, an energy security strategy earlier this month. But the environmental issues of global warming certainly haven't gone away, although I believe personally that they are, are mitigatable, if that's a good word. It's now my pleasure to hand over to Steve Cromer to uh, carry on with the rest of the slides in this pack. Thank you. Thank you, Norman. Can you hear me clearly? Yes, I can. Excellent, good. Okay, so I've put this slide up just to try to make a point. Um, it's titled, The Time of Cheap Energy Has Come to an End, and some people would say, well, we've not had cheap energy, but I'm arguing we have. We've been living in a, a time where we didn't realise how cheap energy actually was. Um, if you take the price of a litre of petrol at £1.60, which is the average, um, and take out the actual cost of that, uh, which is about 27% of the actual cost, break that down, you get a litre of petrol for 43 pence. If you import some uh, French water, some avian water bottled, that's 90, 79 pence. Take off the VAT and the tax off of that, and that comes to 63 pence. So you can clearly see that petrol, for the amount of energy that's in it, the energy density that's in it, is extremely cheap. And we've, we've simply got used to that. And change is coming. Changes coming. So to look at some of the, uh, this is now a set of slides of uh, the data which we have. Um, and this shows you the oil and gas energy mix and where it fits inside on the one side, the UK and then the global energy mix. And you can see that 50% of the energy within the world is still oil and gas. And if you notice the global energy mix, the yellow one there is actually coal. In this country, we've got coal down a lot, but in the rest of the world, coal is still quite a big part of the energy mix. This is UK data. This comes from the, uh, you'll see there's some references down in the right corner, lower corner. That's where I get my data from. So you can go back and look at these charts and search the data if you want to. Um, this is the UK. Look at the coal. The coal is nigh on disappeared now. Um, oil and natural gas still makes up 50% of our energy mix. And then it comes to bioenergy and waste. Nuclear is quite low at the moment. And then wind and solar and hydro. And those are the numbers for 2020 21. 
So, in 2021, we had the North Sea transition deal. This was where we we're going to transition the North Sea from a hydrocarbon system into uh, trying to decarbonize the energy supply using carbon capture and converting it to hydrogen. And then look at the supply chain and use the people and skills. And this is what we set the first four sets of series of uh, presentations on. But as Norman said, everything's changed. Um, the British Energy Strategy was released in April, and that is a direct copy from that strategy. It says, this strategy will set out how Great Britain will accept, accelerate homegrown power for greater energy independence. So now I've got a, a number of slides here, and these are, these are simply cut and paste from that British Energy Security Strategy. Oil and gas, what is the strategy that we have in the future? So, regulatory accelerators for new oil and gas, planned new oil and gas licensing. So the government is telling us that we're going to start doing new oil and gas. Things have certainly changed. CCUS clusters to future-proof the North Sea. You can see that at the end of 22, they're going to have new licensing rounds and a new project regulatory accelerators, 0% Russian oil and gas. It's, not, it's interesting to go right to the end here. In 2050, net zero compatible oil and gas sector. So that is where the government reckon we will be able to get to, and that's their plans. So we're going to have lots of discussion on this after we finish these slides. So... Looking at the breakdown of that as it, as it is today, this is in 2050, the projection. This comes from the uh, International Energy Authority. Now, you can see that even in 2050, they still think that oil and gas is going to be 50% of the mix, even up to 50, 2050. But one thing you should notice from this graph is we have increased our need of energy by 50% as well. So 50% of our energy in 2050 will be oil and gas, but we still have an increase of 50%. So going on to hydrogen, we've talked about hydrogen. I gave a presentation on this. I am no expert on this. I'm an interested bystander, I would call myself. Uh, I've been a lot, done a lot of research on it and looking at it. But this is certainly one way of decarbonizing uh, natural gas. Um, the government intend to double the ambition to 10 gigawatts of hydrogen production capacity. At least 50% of that from electrics. The rest of it, I would believe, come natural gas. So it's interesting to look to see what they're doing at 2020, 2023 20, and right up. So let's look at 2030. They're still saying up to 10 gigawatts by 2030. But then if you look at 2050, there could be 240 to 500 terawatts. That's an enormous leap that the government are expecting to do in 20 years. So this is an area that's going to be expanding rapidly. So there's a plan to deliver 50% of Europe's energy and hydrogen by 2050. They intend to do it rapidly at scale. Hydrogen, they would intend to make hydrogen as cheap as gas, but gas is going up. So what does that actually mean? Direct production from wind farms is already happening. So they're using the electricity from wind farms and making hydrogen. There's a big one down in Glasgow, which is going to start up. Now, the important thing about hydrogen is a principal method of energy storage. With a lot of these uh, methods of storage, like nuclear and wind and solar, the energy may not come at the time that you want it, so you need energy storage. So hydrogen may be one way to go around this. CCUS was not directly in, mentioned inside the uh, energy strategy, but it's included in the hydrogen section. So wind. So what does the government want to do for wind? Cheaper power for local areas by cutting planning and delivering better connections. Interesting fact I learned on the TV, I think it was Boris that said it, um, 
A wind farm can take one year to put up, but it can take five years to get planning permission. So that's what they're going to try to tackle. Um, so the planning and regulation side of things is where they're going to look at wind. Not too much of the technology. I think the technology seems to be where it is. It's got. So in 2022, planning network strategy framework, holistic network design, improving community benefits. So this is to try to see that the community gets something from this wind. Uh, launching an offshore generation section. Well, there you go. Offshore wind is maybe a wee bit more palatable because, you know, the environment out there is there's not going to be anyone complaining about the planning permission issues. So that's maybe a better way of doing things. What do they want to do in 2050? Low cost, net zero, consistent electricity system. Most likely comprised of predominantly wind and solar generation. So they're putting wind and solar right up there. So planning permission is the biggest hurdle. Proposed changes may mean more onshore wind farms may be allowed. And we're obviously going to go for offshore. We can get pretty big. And floating ones, so it allows us to work in deep water. And then, of course, you can use it for your hydrogen. Now, this was something that we did not uh, look at within our group of four um, presentations because it was outside our scope, really. We didn't uh, know too much about this. But the government really look at delivering a very high ambition on nuclear. By 2050, they want 24 gigawatt, taking up 25% of the total GB demand. So they're wanting a quarter of our energy to be from nuclear by 2050. That's interesting. There's some questions here that some of the team have put together. Will it take a long time to get the approvals and planning permission? Again, nobody wants nuclear very close to their particular house. Have we got the skills to produce eight or ten nuclear power plants of those sizes? The cost of the construction of these nuclear plants will be added to energy bills. Anyone who wants to double check on that should get onto the internet. There's an enormous amount of a cost going to go onto our already expensive energy bills to pay up front for these nuclear plants. And you need energy storage. When they built the Hunterson Power Station in Scotland, they built the Ben Kruachan uh, energy storage system, the hydro energy storage system. And or the obvious question, will that strategy morph into small, smaller nuclear reactors? So again, solar, uh, they will really want to ramp up on development on both roofs and on the ground. The roof is more uh, local for people. And uh, there are people, even up here in Aberdeen, there are people putting enough solar up on the roof that they're not, not actually having to pay for any energy from the grid. They're actually selling to the grid. So even in Aberdeen, we can get uh, sufficient solar to make that work. So by 2050, the ambition is a low cost, net zero, consistent electricity system, predominantly wind and solar. They, they think wind and solar is the majority of our energy by 2050. So massive increase, reduced time getting planning permission again. Most solar panels are made in China. And if anyone has tried to buy a cooker or a washing machine or any type of hard goods, you'll discover that the price has gone up about 50% because of the shipping costs have gone up 50%. Um, so the costs of those panels are going to go up like everything else. But home energy systems, the economics of home en energy are more attractive. I looked at putting solar panels on the roof of my house uh, just, just at Christmas. And they said, well, it's going to get you your money back in 25 years. And I thought, well... I'm 63. Am I going to get my money back? That doesn't make much sense. But I redid the calculation just a wee while ago, and it's now down to 20 years because of the cost of energy has gone up. So the economics are making it more attractive, and that is the effect we're having. But with solar, you need some kind of energy storage again. Now, what was not mentioned? 
geothermal was not mentioned there. Now, we as a team think that geothermal has got some potential. Um, there's going to be some more of that from some of the team. We'll talk about that. Waste to energy, uh, anaerobic digesters, and of course, direct air capture of CO2. You know, there's a, there's a whole test being done at the moment to see if we can just simply suck some of the CO2 straight out the atmosphere and stick it down old oil wells. And that makes an awful lot of sense if that technology is, is viable. Okay, I did a wee bit more research. Now, we all need to get this energy security thing sorted out pretty damn fast. Now, these are the construction times, not the planning permission times, the construction times. Onshore wind, we can put up a wind farm within one or two years. A big one at that. Offshore wind, the guys are throwing these out. No bother, one to two years. Solar, again, one to two years. Just getting hold of your panels is the issue there. Hydrogen on scale it needs to be uh, a bit longer, so three to five years. An oil and gas facility, I think five to ten years is uh, pretty, going pretty fast. But they reckon nuclear can be built within five to seven years. So if we are needing to get this done pretty fast and get our energy security sorted out, we've really only got wind and solar as the ways of getting that up just now. So that's another thing we will discuss in our discussion. And here it is. Gentlemen, are you all in there? Right. Thank you, Steve, for that excellent presentation. I know you put it together very quickly following the government's energy security paper. Uh, nope. I'll address one question from the audience immediately, um, which is the whether you can see this again. It will be on the IMECI website within the next few days, the whole discussion and the whole recording. Um, <clears throat> first, I'd like to address a question to Steve Johnson. Uh, regarding uh, CCUS. Uh, clearly, oil is going to be with us for many years to come. Will CCUS be able to take out all the CO2 and make it acceptable to the environmentalists, if anything is ever acceptable to environmentalists? Steve Johnson, please. Hi, Norman. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, uh, heard the question. Um, I think, you know, if you look at any process and the efficiency of a process then you know getting down to absolute zero co2 carbon removal um, is something that you know isn't really practical and possible um, you know clearly um, you know if you look at any process system where you're extracting you get down to low levels but the lower you get the more difficult it becomes to actually fully extract so um, yeah, there clearly is going to be some constraints based upon the technology, and there's a lot of innovation and uh, research going on at the moment, and various different projects and investments being made at quite a pace to actually look at what are the best technologies to allow um, you know, extraction of uh, emissions, not just from um, you know, oil and gas production, but from heavy industries. And what was mentioned there also was you know, extracting directly from from the air, so I think we can get down to you know with the with that investment we can get down to low levels um whether that will be absolute zero uh, personally, my thoughts are that it won't um but you know, uh, would certainly be getting down to you know, low levels which um will be driven essentially by you know, the limitations of the technology, whether that will be acceptable from the perspective of um you know, the environmental lobbies and stakeholders, you know, that's that's a question I can't really answer. What I would say is that you can see and you know, the, the slides that were presented are very consistent with other studies that have been done. And in, in fact, the the previous reports you know, issued by the government around the, you know, the fair energy transition, that oil and gas has got a significant role to play, not just in the UK energy mix, but globally. Um, you know, as we move forward and you know to enable that um, to be as acceptable as as it can be ccus has got a has got a big role to play and clearly you know that's reflected in in the strategy that's just been talked through and also the investments being made currently 
Yeah, I was just thinking Thank to you. myself about uh, the CO2 coming down to zero level. You know, I, I learned in my secondary school that the trees need the CO2. So, you know, there's a certain amount of uh, CO2 going to be absorbed by nature itself. So so getting down to zero level is probably uh, not, not necessary. You know, uh, I think we just need to make sure we get to a balance that the planet can actually handle. That's the issue, isn't it? Yes, thank you, Steve. Uh, just uh, uh, questions are beginning to come in, so I just remind the audience: uh, if you've got a question, put it into the question box, and we'll handle as many as we possibly can. Um, I'd like to just deal next with wind and ask Dave Reetham to comment. I, I seem to recall uh, that uh, the reduced, the quicker planning permission was also going to be linked with. Uh, uh, some reduced energy costs for the households that were in the neighbourhood. So uh, it really boils down to will onshore wind be welcomed by areas of the community or not? Dave Reetham, please. Can you hear me okay? Yes, fine. Thank you. Good, good. Uh, I, I think it's a, it's a question fraught with, uh, with, with challenges if you only have to look at some of the uh, the reason and the less reasonable posts you can get on your average uh, uh, Facebook account related to any wind farm that goes onshore. So I wouldn't want to be drawn into whether it becomes more acceptable. However, I, I think it's fair to say that given the, the rise in energy costs, the political environment, and if mechanisms could be found that communities who are more affected by uh, wind farms were to be um, uh, better incentivized and I think that could be a big help to making it uh, more palatable to communities. It's fair to say that those mechanisms do exist but already and there are community funds but whether it could also be rolled out that say uh, people within a radius uh, of a farm may also get uh, re localized reductions yeah, that may also help uh, as well. So there can be a number of mechanisms, I'm sure, developed that might possibly, uh, you know, help with that. Thank you, David. I'm just looking at some of the, the questions that are coming in. One uh, is about reducing um, the amount of energy used, uh, which clearly is important. Uh, clearly, the panel are more experienced in producing uh, systems that can do energy rather than necessarily save it in the household. Any of the panel want to make any comment on that question, which was, uh, which sorry, I've missed, lost the question, um, but it, it was what about it really was re relating to uh, insulating of houses, etc. No, no, I can answer that no. in a wee bit. Um, Steve. Steve Cromer first, and I'll pick up whoever else it was. Okay, no, Steve Johnson. Right, right. Well, Steve Cromer first. Thanks very much. Two things. Uh, I put some insulation into my house, and I was amazed the difference that it actually made. It was quite unbelievable. It was only uh, 100 millimetres of normal urethane foam with a foil at the back. I had the opportunity to put that into the roof uh, when I was doing some roof repairs, so I just did that. And an enormous amount of difference. Now, the other thing that I did, and, and I feel rather, rather stupid about this, I had an old boiler, which was uh, just one of those old ones that you see in the TV, the flames and the boiler above it. And uh, I thought, oh, my goodness, the price of a boiler is terrible. I'll just keep it running for another year, another year, another year. And then I got one of these new combination boilers, and immediately my bills went down half. And I got the price of my boiler back in saved gas by simply uh, by one year. And I thought, so foolish. I had been keeping this old, inefficient boiler operating, thinking that I was saving money on a new boiler, and I ended up costing myself money. So I think the, the moral of that is that there is new technology out there. Uh, I think if we, and it is much, much more efficient. So if we can put an in insulation into houses and use that new technology, it, we can really reduce our gas. And I think people are going to be doing that with the prices, the price is going to drive that. Sorry, Steve Johnson, you were going to say something. Yeah, thanks for that, uh, Steve. Um, for me, this question is very pertinent and it gets to the, the nub of the, 
of something that is really not being discussed. You know, a lot of the focus is on what energy, what form of energy, not the amount of energy. Um, and I do think this is part of the discussion that needs to be addressed. If we're really going to get to a place that was you know, a point that was well made you know, by uh, Steve, which is um, in the frame of the use of oil, continued use of oil and gas, we want to get to a level where we're essentially producing energy in a way that is sustainable, sustainable for the planet, the future of our children, etc. Then we also not only have to ask the questions of how that demand is met, but what demand that that is, and essentially um, looking at how we can be as efficient as possible and reduce down uh, the the energy man demands, not just from a domestic point of view, but in terms of the various industry users is an important uh, factor here. We, we shouldn't just assume that uh, the demand is inexhaustible and you know, we as a society should you know, just carry on as we are. I think we also need to get into conversation about doing things more effectively, more efficiently. And, and certainly what I would say from my own professional experience, there's a lot of work already happening um, from an efficiency perspective in industry um, to not just look at how we change the way we're running those industries, but if we can actually be more efficient, reduce the amount of energy that's used as part of driving down the overall emissions that are, that are produced uh, going forward. And I think that's where we also need to have uh, more discussion and, and, and a strategy uh, as part of the, the way we go forward. Thank Norman, you, I could just comment on that. Yes, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I, John Clegg here. Yeah, part of the question was about ground source heat pumps. And um, as some of you might know from seeing a previous webinar, I was advocating for geothermal energy. Um, it's kind of surprising that the authors of the UK energy strategy either ignored the potential of geothermal energy or aren't aware of it. Um, and it, it spans quite a broad um, sort of uh, range from electrical power generation uh, at one end, but through to uh, heating of uh, domestic buildings and light industrial uses like horticulture uh, at the other end. Um, if you look at what happens in Europe and look at how geothermal energy is used in Europe and how things like um, heat pumps are used for residential and light industrial, you look at the amount of money the DOE in the US is currently spending on this, it's surprising to me that it's absent from our own strategy in the UK. Uh, even though there is geothermal activity going on in the UK, there are people drilling geothermal wells at the moment for uh, electricity generation. And I, I think the questioner's point was good. And I, I think that um, especially for heating, and we think about the amount of new uh, residential housing that's being built, there is an opportunity to provide heating uh, in a way which um, reduces our uh, use of gas. I think a significant amount of gas is used for heating buildings. Thank you, John. I'm gonna just touch on myself and then ask any of the panel to comment further. The question about tidal energy. I do believe that I've read that Orkney is totally self-sufficient in renewable energy now through wind and tide. Uh, and tidal energy is now being successfully applied in a couple of locations and I think there are quite a few uh, estuary tidal uh, systems being planned uh, and yet it doesn't seem to appear in the government strategic security paper. Uh, am I correct in that and has any of the panel got any comments on tidal energy or even sub subsurface uh, marine currents? No, I've got quiet in this area, so it is a subject that uh, we haven't applied ourselves to because we did not see necessarily the skills of the oil and gas industry being directly applied to it. No, no I mean, perhaps I could maybe answer a bit of that. Uh, as, as far as I understand, and I may be wrong here, tidal only works in certain areas where there's very high, uh, either high tidal flow or high tidal uh, movement. So I think, uh, as I understand it, there are restricted areas around the country. Certainly Orkney's got some big tidal flows and uh, it can generate quite a bit of power from that. But uh, I would need, we would need to look at an ex, ask an expert on that. Yeah. Thank you, Steve. 
I would like to come back to hydrogen again. I've got a question here about uh, energy storage, which personally I believe will be its major contribution, but it is being used in transport and well, as well. So it is a method of producing uh, energy uh, for transportation and there have been uh, prototype trains and buses running on it. Uh, Steve, uh, Steve Crum, would you like to comment further? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Hydrogen is definitely a method of storing, there's no doubt about it, and it is inefficient. You know, you start off with electricity and then make hydrogen, and you'll get losses in that. Uh, or you start off with some natural gas and you make hydrogen, so you've obviously got losses in that whole process. But if you've got excess electricity which you cannot use, you know, in the middle of the night where there's a nuclear plant operating and there's no load on the system, then you've got to store that energy somewhere. And hydrogen is one of the options for that. So that, that's where it sort of comes into its own as a method of storing. However, I will say this. We're starting to get new electric cars. And uh, those are quite efficient. They're very fast. The, the first electric cars were really sports cars. Um, but when you start coming to heavy transport, things like bin lorries and uh, heavy lorries, heavy buses, here in Aberdeen, they're producing, those are being produced with hydrogen. So in my humble opinion, I think that cars and light vehicles are probably more better being lent to electric with batteries because the batteries are quite heavy. But when you get to heavier vehicles like buses, bin lorries, so these more construction things, uh, hydrogen is a better option because you don't have the heavy buses um, and you've got quite a good energy density. And uh, if you have to use that energy from a a nuclear power station or a wind farm and you have no use for that, hydrogen is definitely a good way of, of adding that to the mix. Thank you, Steve. Uh, uh, comment on that. Steve Johnson Steve here. Yeah. Steve Johnson, please. Uh, thanks, Norman. Uh, I'm at the the only thing I was going to add to that is that there is a lot of work as well in terms of the storage, but also transportation of the energy itself. So if we converted everything to some form of purely electrical supply, the actual grid network um, that we currently have within the UK is insufficient to transport all that energy to point of use. But we do have um, an extensive you know, national transmission system, which is currently designed for uh, for natural gas, uh, obviously, as we're all aware, as domestic users, but also industrial usage as well. Um, and by using hydrogen as a means for transportation of energy as well as storage, that means that we overcome some of the challenges and limitations with the current electricity grid capacity um, if we look forward to the, you know, the projected energy demands that we have purely here in the UK. And that's another factor that you know, uh, makes hydrogen a useful uh, tool within the actual mix going forward. Thank you, Steve. And we all should remember that uh, solar, of course, sun doesn't always, doesn't shine at all in the day and the wind doesn't always blow. So we do need energy storage and hydrogen seems to offer uh, a better option than, than batteries. I, I do know of a couple of plants that are being wind plants being built off Norway that uh, are being built purely to produce hydrogen by uh, taking that out of the seawater and not produce electricity at all. Uh, so thank you. For that any other comments on that subject from the panel? Yeah, Norman, uh, John here. There was um, a study done by the IMAC, I think just over two years ago, the beginning of 2020 looking at mainly at like passenger vehicles and um, alternative fuel options for passenger vehicles. And one of the points it noted is that a lot of people, um, including some policy making people, tend to get um, sort of focused on tailpipe emissions, which are the emissions that are generated when a vehicle is actually driven. And obviously for hydrogen and for um, like hydrogen fuel cell vehicles and battery electric vehicles, the tailpipe emissions are zero. But one of the things the report did was look at um, sort of total life cycle uh, emissions. And um, when you take into account the cost of manufacturing a battery in terms of resource utilization and emissions, and also the, the cost of decommissioning an EV in terms of uh, emissions, um, the electric vehicles don't rate quite as 
they're not quite as clean as people think they are. Um, and in fact, uh, the IMAKEYS report went on to show that if you could use biofuels, you might actually be able to produce uh, internal combustion engine vehicles that were uh, lower emission than, uh, than, than than battery electric. Uh, and that's notwithstanding the amount of emi the temporary emissions surge that would be uh, sort of created if we all traded our vehicles in for brand new ones uh, now. Um, to a couple of other points on uh, hydrogen, uh, it, it does have some uh, sort of um, volatility. And so it does tend to be better suited to um, vehicles that are continuously used. So things like uh, taxis, trains, buses, uh, bin lorries, as Steve said, the stuff which have continuous usage are perhaps better suited to it than passenger vehicles that are going to be sat on people's driveways for, uh, for, for days or possibly even weeks at a time with people working from home. Thank you, John. And of course, electric vehicles brings in the whole subject of a further new uh, huge network of charging points, which I know the government's beginning to address and a lot of uh, supermarkets do it. But uh, uh, if all the cars were tra suddenly transferred to electric, uh, we just wouldn't have enough capacity in that either. Got a question here, um, which I'll read out and see if any member of the panel want to comment. It says, modern home boilers burn gas at 90% efficiency, which is outstanding. Why should we waste gas on other processes, e.g. electricity generation? Uh, my first reaction, personal one, is, is I would have thought that uh, large plants generating electricity would be as efficient as modern home boilers. I don't know whether that's true. Any member on the panel want to comment? I could go back to an earlier point, Norman, and say that at it's possible for pretty much all of us to heat our homes um, using things like um, sort of uh, uh, sort of heat pumps and uh, sort of ground loops without uh, using any gas at all. And so perhaps that should be a longer term aspiration. And uh, you know, turn the question around: Why waste gas on heating houses when there are other um, sort of um, sort of feasible uh, ways of doing it? Thank you, John. I think I think there's one thing we can sort of uh, deduce. You know, the fact that modern home boilers burn gas at 90%, that's true. Uh, and that modern gas used to be a quarter of the amount of cost, money, cost in order to produce that with electricity. So by burning it in electrical generation and then putting that down through the wires to generate the same kilowatt of energy in your house, increases the cost to the customer four times. So heating by gas is four times cheaper than heating by electricity. So he's absolutely right. You know, energy-wise, uh, somebody's making a buck here somewhere. Um, but the obvious thing is, burning gas just straightforward is obviously producing so much CO2 that we really need to get away from that. Thank you, uh, Steve. Question here about hydrogen. We've talked a lot about it. Uh, question is, is it a greenhouse gas? Will it have any detrimental effect on the climate uh, in the way that CO2 and uh, other gases are, are said to do? Any any comment on that from Steve or anybody else? Steve Cromer? Yeah, I, I don't think it's a greenhouse gas. You know, when, when you burn hydrogen, it's the hydrogen and the oxygen combine and make make water to make steam, you know. So that that's going to work quite well. Um, the other part of the question was diffusing, seeping, leaking. Yes, all of those things are true. Hydrogen, uh, with it being the smallest molecule, will leak. It will leak through things that were norm not normally going to leak. Metal to metal seals are the only way to get through that. And to some extent. Hydrogen does come through metal, you know. Over a period of time, hydrogen will find its way through metal. And certain metals, if they're, uh, they're not of the right uh, quality metallurgy-wise, uh, you can end up with hydrogen stress corrosion cracking. So certainly there's a lot of issues there to be looked at, a lot of uh, work for engineers to do, and, well, jobs for us as, a, as an industry. Yes. I do recall way back in my youth, I visited the uh, British Gas Centre, I think it was in Battersea somewhere, the research centre, 
just after town gas was replaced by um, North Sea North Sea gas, Much and worse. all the on the pipes leaked uh, because they were, 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 were then I think fibrous material that just came out the gas just came out of there causing considerable problems of course. Yep. Um, question to all the panel: um, Is is no there worries. any funding? Sorry, go ahead. Who is it? Sorry, is that was Hello? John. Um, on the question about hydrogen being a greenhouse gas, I mean, there has been some work done by the um, UK government um, on looking at it. And the, the last work I saw, the, it was a little bit inconclusive. Yeah, hydrogen, if it escapes, um, is potentially a greenhouse gas. But um, I think that the findings that I saw were based on a about 1% leakage rate uh from a hydrogen system whether that's plausible or not i mean that that's a question for debate uh then they thought the global warming of consequences of hydrogen leakage would be relatively uh, small um but there was a caveat to the report i think there is still some work to be done to understand the long-term effects of having free hydrogen in the atmosphere thank you john um question on funding uh, is there any funding backing up the uh, transfer of uh, skills to the various technologies that have been mentioned? Is any member of the panel aware of any government initiatives to retrain or for uh, any engineers and necessarily support services? Yes, so I think it was slide number eight where I talked about the North Sea transition deal. So that was a deal that was being set up uh, within the northeast of Scotland about the decarbonisation, carbon capture and storage. And there was a thing on that about people and skills. Uh, this is from Oil and Gas UK. I think they've changed their name again. Uh, but you can find this on their website. Uh, securing, stimulating and creating tens of thousands of high quality jobs in the industrial heartlands. So, you know, the Scotland... Uh, and North East in particular, we're trying to make ourselves a transition uh, energy hub. We used to call ourselves the oil and gas energy hub, and we're now wanting to call ourselves the transition energy hub. Um, so there is funding available. I don't know where it comes from, but one of the first places I would look is certainly the, uh, the Oil and Gas UK website and the, the old OGA. They've all got new names nowadays, but those are the places I would look for funding. And the other oh, the one, uh, uh, um, oh, I can't remember the name. If I, find, if I remember, I'll tell you before the end of the presentation. Thank you, Steve. We've had a comeback on this hydrogen, uh, which uh, correctly does burn to water vapor, but I don't think I'm aware of water vapor being a greenhouse gas. Any comments from the panel? Yeah, well, that's called clouds, isn't it? Yeah, well, exactly. It is clouds. <laughs> That's clouds. So right. maybe clouds are a greenhouse. Well, certainly keep the heat in, but I don't think it's a big issue, to be honest. No, I, um, of course, all the um, environmental stuff shows large amounts of water vapor coming up the top of uh, cooling towers, which is essentially most of it is as clean as water vapor. Uh, a couple more questions come in. There is funding from the Marine Society for seafarers to get offshore safety courses. Uh, thank you for that, to whoever right. put that in. Um, for a large power station generation, don't you think producing hydrogen from CH4 is, is not as efficient as it could be see, seen during to CO2 sequestration problem? Yes, clearly there's a loss of uh, energy when we take the CO2 out. Um, Yes, um, yes, yes. That that's, a, that's absolutely um, you know, it, It's very inefficient. Every time you change an energy source into another energy source, you lose you lose energy. You it's inefficient doing all of that. So what what you're saying is, uh, take the flue gas, which is mostly CO2, and then simply stick that down an old oil well. Now that can be done. That's being done. People are looking at that. Um, so yes, that's. It saves a bit of energy, but the only problem with flue gas is it tends to have a lot of uh, uh, things that can actually gum up your well and your pipes and your 
and your turbines and all that sort of thing. But yes, uh, it's more efficient. If you can get it from one energy source, take out the energy you want, and then dispose of the CO2 as efficiently as possible, that's the crux of the matter. So I think changing it to hydrogen and then burning it and then getting rid of the CO2 in another way, it may or may not work out better that way in the long term. Thank you, Steve, once more. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we seem to have addressed all the questions. I'm now going around ask and ask each member of the panel if they want to say anything more before I begin to draw this uh, webinar to a close. So first, uh, Steve Johnson. Um, yeah, thank you, Norman. I think the the only additional comment I would make is that having been in the energy sector all of my career, um, this is a time of tremendous change, but I think um, it's also a time of tremendous opportunity. You know, the, the perspective that we started these webinars on is different to where we are now. Um, we can see the scale of the change that the UK government, but also globally, increasingly people are looking at. Um, with If you're in the oil and gas sector, the message around uh, um, that's been consistent through the whole journey, maybe not emphasized as much as it has been in the latest security strategy is that oil and gas is still going to be part of the energy mix in some form uh, for uh, a long time to come. Um, but also, um, you know, the energy transition is, is beginning to build momentum. Now that creates tremendous opportunity for individuals with the skills in the oil and gas sector and you know engineers across a whole range of disciplines and and, and other people with you know the relevant skills uh, to contribute in that journey I, I i foresee in the future that there is going to be a world of opportunity for individuals who want to play a part in any part of that picture that we've uh, uh, painted today um, um, and you know, uh, it, it's really going to be an exciting time for people coming into you know, the engineering sector um, in supporting energy, whether it's in the renewables, whether it's in hydrogen, or whether it's in the traditional oil and gas sector. I think it's going to be a world of choice uh, for individuals to continue to have very fruitful careers. Thank you, Steve. And Steve Cromer next, but first, um, we did get a question earlier on about the, some of the statistics you gave. I believe you indicated very clearly on the on the slides which were UK and which were world. Is yes. that not correct? And which? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, there's there's global statistics and there's a uh, UK statistics. I think there was a, just a couple at the start of my presentation were global statistics. The ones at the call. So so yes, just to summarise for myself. Um, I'd like to throw another couple of statistics at you. Um, the UK is the fifth largest economy in the world. And please, please go and Google these numbers. Don't just take these numbers from me. So the UK is the fifth largest uh, economy by GDP on the planet. Our percentage of CO2 production on the planet is 1.3%. The UK produces 1.3% of the planet's CO2. And I think that a lot of that's to do with the way we've got rid of coal and some of those dirtier industries. Um, so if we can do that, the rest of the world can do that. So I feel that the Institute of Mechanical Engineers is the, is, can do the groundwork here in the UK, develop the technologies, develop the know-how, develop the political drive, that's what it takes, to make these changes. And hopefully the rest of the world will start looking at these those sort of ratios of GDP to CO2 production. If everyone did that, then I think we'd have this problem solved. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next, uh, John Clegg. Anything further you want to say? Uh, no, I, I think we've um, we've we've made. There's been a lot of good points made. Um, I will come back. I I'm, I uh, I didn't unmute myself quickly enough. Question about um, sort of water vapor being a greenhouse gas. 
is a little bit complicated because yeah, water vapor is a big greenhouse gas. I mean, you know, about I don't know, I don't know exact number, something like half the greenhouse effect comes from clouds. Um and without clouds we'd um we'd probably be freezing to death. So it's a good thing that they're there. But the greenhouse potential of water is a bit complicated because uh, the temperature of the air governs the amount of water that can be uh, held by it. Um, so I don't think that adding water vapor to the atmosphere in itself is a greenhouse uh, accelerator. Um, I think the um, you do have a kind of positive feedback effect where the warmer the air gets, the more water vapor it can hold and so on. So you've got the potential for runaway, but there's plenty of water around that can evaporate out of oceans and lakes and stuff like that already. Uh, to, um, to to basically fulfil the potential, so I don't think I don't think producing water is necessarily a um, a, a bad thing. Uh, on a broader scope, I, I think there's a lot of potential for um, technologies to uh, address uh, global warming, and we've heard about a number of them today. Um, we saw a few of them in the uh, in the UK um, energy strategy uh, report that. Um, that Steve quoted from uh, during the slides. Um, I'll kind of repeat something I said earlier and pick up on another point that was made. It, it does seem to be a bit of a scattergun approach in that there are one or two um, alternative renewable energy technologies that have been picked up by the government and they want to run with them and they're headline grabbers. But there are others and Tidal was one of them and geothermal is another one. And you know, even if tidal energy is only available in certain parts of the UK, there are parts of the UK where there is potential. Uh, Northern Ireland, southwest of England, uh, two examples that I'm aware of. And it's kind of disappointing that we don't have a holistic uh, strategy that covers all potential uh, uh, sources of energy that, uh, that that could contribute. But that's not to uh, detract from the, I think the message of the uh, the, the webinars is that there is a lot of adjacent technology and a lot of adjacent skills that could be transported from oil and gas into these industries. And I think it's good to make people aware of them and aware of the potential opportunities. Thank you very much, John. David Reetham, any further comments, please? Um, nothing more from uh, from me. I suppose the observation, of course, uh, about hydrogen, I was thinking of as a generation source. It, it is, of course, going to need a sink source from from power, from solar, from wind uh, as well. It'll be interesting to see if that does or does not start to supplant uh, transport. I could see a mix of both, potentially, when we're looking at heavy duty uh, use, you know, where batteries may not be uh, optimal, you know, uh, for heavy transport, aviation, agriculture, those industries as well. Um, but uh, no, those are my uh, main comments uh, for the moment. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. Uh, all the panel will be able to see a, a final statement rather than question saying that the UK government study did say that eight hydrogen is a greenhouse gas and could have a gloaming, global warming effect over 100 years. Um, I, uh, I take the point if it said there. Any comment from the panel on that particular statement? I just say thanks, Rob, for finding the study that I was trying to recollect. Um, <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, I think, and Rob pointed out that about 0.4 to 4 percent of the benefit of changing the hydrogen from fossil fuels is consumed by its leakage rate and the inadvertent production of some greenhouse gas. So, suggest that it's um, still worth doing. Uh, but uh, yeah, thanks, thanks, Rob, for uh, bringing that to the attention of the. Uh, of the panel. Yeah, thank you. thank you, Steve. And also, somebody else did give some training things uh, on, uh, or oh, no, further link on hydrogen, which the panel will see. It's uh, from wiley.com. I'll not give the whole link. Uh, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Um, the we have, thank you very much for all your questions. It makes it very interesting for ourselves in the panel. Um, this is the final fifth webinar that we've planned in, uh, and presented, but we are thinking very uh, hard about having a further series starting in the later in this year, in the autumn, uh, where we might bring in some of these other technologies that we tended to exclude because we didn't see necessarily directly links between uh, the oil industry 
uh, and, uh, and the technology for energy transition, such as nuclear. Um, and we all have some skepticism of whether we can build eight nuclear power stations from scratch in anything like a reasonable time to have a, an impact. Uh, I think Margaret Thatcher originally was going to build one per year, but that didn't happen. Uh, but uh, several of us are very keen on the fact that small modular reactors may, in fact, become quite uh, relatively easy to build and have a, an impact which might uh, be useful to discuss in the future. Um, the slide has gone a bit blurred um, to me. I don't know why, but uh, the final slide, which will be on the package that you can disc that you can, there we are. The, the final slide does give a link that if you want a CPD certificate for attending this uh, webinar, please go ahead. So with that, I wish you all a, a happy and successful afternoon and a safe uh, life hereafter. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.